So let us continue with the uh, second part of the lecture. Um, and you have seen the um, schedule already. So we are now here. We start with a brief summary of what the Kegel platform is. Uh, and we continue with the main thing then uh, of, of this message I, I like to give you, namely the importance of defining a domain of applicability of machine learning models. So Kegel. Kegel has been founded in 2010 and is a platform that offered machine learning competitions. And we took part of one of them and this is why I want to describe that and I hope you like it. It was bought by Google in 2017 and now it also offers a public data platform, a cloud-based workbench for data science and artificial intelligence education. Here I just summarize or copied from their webpage uh, the educational aspect, which I will not discuss very much. I just wanted to show this briefly. There is a machine learning tutorial. There's a tutorial on what they call pandas, um, short hands-on challenges to perfect your data manipulation skills. There are tutorials on Python, uh, the main language for machine learning nowadays besides R, <clears throat> and there are tutorials on deep learning and because they are bought by Google uh, with an emphasis on TensorFlow. We had taken part in a competition and uh, that is defined in general as follows. Uh, in a competition, the competition host prepares the data and the description of the problem. Then participants experiment with different techniques and compete against each other to produce, produce the best models. Work is shared publicly through Kegel to achieve a better benchmark and to inspire new ideas. That creates also a very competitive atmosphere. And after the deadline passes, the deadline is set from the very beginning, after the deadline passes, the um, host together with Kegel do an evaluation and the host pays the price money. Here you see uh, the Kegel webpage from 2018 or 2017. Um, and as it says, this is for predicting transparent conductors. Predict the key properties of novel transparent semiconductors. We started this thing by uploading data and the description on December 18, 2017. And the end date was set to February 15, 2018, so two months later. Already a few hours after we had submitted uh, our data and the description, uh, a dozen groups had actually contributed with the first ideas. And at the very end, we had 878 teams, different teams all over the globe who had contributed to find a model to, to suggest a model, to demonstrate that they can really do a good prediction for novel transparent semiconductors. We had a prize money set of 5,000 euro, as you see it here. Uh, this was not really high compared to what other people have done. Um, I think industry had similar or different, but, but analogous uh, uh, competition. They gave something like 40,000 euro. I think the US government even got, uh, gave for one type of screening, uh, one million dollar. Uh, Still a lot of people really contributed here, which was mainly because it was a basic science uh, type of competition. We start with a motivation and, and so, so what we give as a motivation is that innovative materials design is needed to tackle some of the most important health, environmental, energy, social and economic challenges of the century. In particular, improving the properties of materials that are intrinsically connected to the generation and utilization of energy is crucial and so on and so on. And then we gave more specific uh, um, 
explanation why these systems, namely these transparent conductors, in particular group three oxides, namely aluminum, gallium, indium, sesquioxides are important. They are some of the most promising transparent semiconductors or conductors because of a combination of both large band gap energies, which leads to optical transparency over the visible range and high conductivities. These materials are also chemically stable and relatively inexpensive to produce and so on. So you see this also on the next uh, transparency. Again, uh, we're talking about aluminum gallium indium oxide, where the stoichiometry is that we have two cations, aluminum gallium indium, uh, the X plus Y plus Z should add up to two and oxygen three. And this is plotted here, the band gap as a function of the average bond length. So we, we use in the X axis, the average bond length because we have three parameters, X, Y, Z, which we cannot identify or, or plot very nicely. But depending on X, Y, Z, the bond length between the cation of the oxygen is of course different. And so you could identify roughly at least uh, these um, systems by the average bond length. And then you see that the band gap of all these different stoichiometries, which you can produce as a function of average bond length, changes significantly. It changes from close to nine electron volts for alpha alumina to about three electron volts for indium oxide. So in tuning, the mixture of aluminum, gallium, indium, you could create whatever band gap you want. And you are somewhat in this range indicated by this blue triangle. Now that sounds very simple, but in fact, even the three corner uh, uh, materials, which are shown here are significantly different, not just because of the material, which is different. Uh, the first one, alpha aluminum oxides, I mean, they all have different uh, um, a polymorphs, different structure. Um, the, the stable one of alumina of, is alpha alumina, uh, which has 10 atoms per unit cell. So basically four aluminum atoms and six oxygen atoms. Gallium oxide has a different structure, same stoichiometry, but a different structure that is called beta gallium oxide, which is in fact 20 atoms per unit cell. And Indium oxide, the stable one here is the cubic phase, and that has 80 atoms per unit cell. So very different situations, not just that the chemistry is different, but also the atomic structure is different. And so the information which we provide for the, chemi for, for, for the Kegel competition, the information provided is the composition, that means the X, Y, and Z, the space group, uh, the lattice vectors and angles, but in a more generalized way. So not really explicitly for the self-consistent. These are all calculations, I should say. So we are theoreticians. So, so we gave uh, results from uh, density function theory calculations. So we gave an average type of lattice vectors and angles. And we gave then as a result, as the properties, one should predict the cohesive energy or formation energy, which is somewhat a proxy for the stability and the band gap, which is the proxy for the transparency. Altogether, we gave a, a training set of 2,400 different systems. This you see in the left triangle here, uh, where on the upper part is pure aluminum oxide, on the left corner is gallium oxide, on the right corner is indium oxide, and every point in this triangle is a different composition, and the color code gives the uh, formation energy uh, uh, of, of, of this material. So the left triangle shows the systems which we provided for training and the right triangle shows the systems, the so-called test set, which were used for predicting and for testing. Uh, there were six different lattice types. So the three you have seen on top, alpha, beta and cubic indium oxide, but altogether there were six different lattice types and different sizes of the unit cell between 10 and 80 atoms per unit cell. So very different situations, which with these data, we wanted that people predict the uh, um, formation energies and the um, band gap. This is the result. Uh, these are from these 878 teams, the top three uh, in, 
in, in an evaluation which which gives uh, uh, the lowest uh, uh, errors for formation energies and for the band gap. And the three top people in this list are not just really using different methods. I mean, they're do, using different representations and a different regressor. So the first one is Tony Y, a person from Japan who is somewhat running a small company there, but still having fun in, 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 in doing uh, uh, these, these competitions. Um, this method is called Ngram. This is a crystal graph representation. So, so what, what you have to do is uh, in, in any machine learning model, you have to somewhat provide the information about the system in a consistent, in a consistent way to the uh, methodology which you like to use. And he transformed the information about uh, atoms and structure into a graph representation, which he got an idea from language recognition uh, in a sense that uh, uh, engrams mean somewhat, if you have say two words, what is the likelihood that the third word is such and such? Or if you have three words, can you predict word number four and so on? And in this way, he uh, uh, mimicked somewhat the structure of the crystal, having an aluminum and an oxygen atom and having really the number of nearest neighbors in a consistent way. And, uh, and, and, and with this input, telling the geometry and the na chemical nature, but not much more, not, not more. He then used kernel rich regression for the prediction. And as I said, this was the winning method. This was a method which at this point we didn't know. Um, uh, and, and it was in fact very interesting to learn about this. Uh, number two is Yuri Lysogorsky. He is from uh, Bochum, so from Germany. They used a very complicated representation, uh, somewhat with a lot of knowledge, uh, a representation which has information about the chemical nature of the atoms, uh, ionization energy and, and, and nature of wave functions, and so-called bond order potentials. Bond order potentials is an idea from, from solid state theory in again telling a little bit about the nearest neighbor and second nearest neighbor distances and and connectivity of which you have in, in, in solids. With a rather complicated input, they then used LGBM, which is light gradient boost machine. This is a type of um, uh, decision tree. A method, a method which I think has been developed by, by Microsoft. Uh, and with this, they made it to place number two. Number three is SOAP. Uh, um, that is a person from England, Lars Blumenthal. And SOAP means soft overlap of atomic potential. So another way to encode the geometry uh, of the crystal. SOAP puts Gaussian functions at every atom and uh, calculates the overlap uh, uh, of these Gaussians. And, and in, in this, from this overlap uh, matrix, basically, um, or this overlap is, is used as an indicator of the local geometry and of the chemistry. And with this input, they then are running a neural network uh, uh, approach. And they made it to number three in this competition. And you see the root mean square errors, in fact, this is root mean square logarithmic errors. We wanted a, 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 a transformation where the errors of, of the formation energy and then the band gap are somehow comparable. And that's why we use the logarithm of the error. But there is these, these root mean square errors for the formation and, 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 and band gaps are not so different in the three uh, top winners. So, so the top winners are getting very close performance. So the outcome, of the whole thing was, of course, the uh, winners got this prize money, but we also invited them um, and paid the flight and the, and the local expenses to a conference in Lausanne, where they uh, presented their methods and, 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 and where we could discuss actually more details. And there was also a joint publication. So we want to use these uh, uh, things now for the next question, which I call the domain of applicability. 
Now we have seen in the way we have done the analysis uh, that uh, we looked at the, and, and that is what, what typically people do, we looked at the mean absolute or mean square error. Now that is the thing which I now want to question. Is it reasonable to accept or to reject a model just based on its mean error? Maybe the error is different for different data groups of the population. So maybe we should look more carefully into the performance and not just at the mean error. You see this here in, in these results. What you see here on the left is the error distribution for different materials uh, for the n-gram method and for the uh, formation energy. So this is the predicted energy minus the calculated energy in electron volt per cut ion as a function of the calculated DFT formation energy used here as an indicator of the um, material which we have studied. Um, you see actually a lot of materials have a good small error so that the test error, that is the only thing which already counts, is 50 milliEV. The uh, training error is not much away from that. Um, it's, it's just slightly below that. But you see, although the error looks very small, so having an error below 0 0.02 electron volt is not excellent because actually some of the polymorphs have such uh, energy difference, but it's pretty, pretty good as a, as, a, as a machine learning prediction. It looks like, but then you see that a lot of materials have a significantly higher error. Of course, compared to the other ones which are here, it's not a lot, but still it's a significant number. And if you remember that we had realized earlier that from the materials which exist out there, only a few materials are really relevant. It is very dangerous to have such a situation because the relevant could be the one with the big arrows. So this is the situation for the formation energy. And you see here for the band gap, the error distribution is somewhat similar. You have a very small uh, test and or reasonably small test and training error, very close to each other here of something like 0.1 electron volt, but a lot of uh, systems which significantly higher error. This is not good, right? And that in fact, what I mean is when I'm saying, looking only at the mean error is not a good idea. I mean, this is a standard way, but for the for the challenge we are facing in 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 uh, material science, this is not sufficient. So maybe, uh, as we see, the error is distributed, and and why is that? So maybe for certain groups of the population, there aren't enough data. So that could be maybe for certain space groups, we don't have enough data, maybe for certain compositions, for maybe actually for indium rich compounds or what have you. It could be that our data which we produced, although we produce something like 3000 data, maybe that it's still not good enough to have all the different uh, possibilities in the different space groups and the different compositions. But it could be also that there is something like noise in the data, that maybe some of the calculations are not good enough, or particular actually that would be more true if you do experiments where you can't really control things so cleanly as in a, in a theory. Maybe there is some noise in the data and this noise has different strengths, different amplitude for different data groups. And so dealing or treating all the data in the same way may be dangerous in particular in the field of material science. So the domain of applicability is defined by data groups for which the model works particularly well. That means for data groups where the prediction error is small. The concept of domain of applicability we know in general from physics, but every theory has a domain of applicability. Newton's mechanics is working for systems which um, if they are not too small, otherwise you have to do quantum mechanics or systems which are not too fast because if they get close to the speed of light, you have to do relativistic treatments. So maybe we have something similar here also in machine learning models. If we would have identified 
data groups where the model which we have works well, then we have a big advantage. We can use the model with confidence only for the domain which you have identified where it gives reliable answers. We can systematically improve the representation of the model to achieve a better description. So if you understand that the model works for certain classes and for certain classes not so well, we could try to understand a little bit, try to understand why this is. And we may find that maybe the data are not really sufficient they, they may look like big 3000, but maybe they are not sufficient for this high flexibility. So maybe we should improve the data set by adding more data. But of course, we should add more data for the regions outside the domain of replicability. And then, of course, we can create a new and improved model because we have systematically advanced our material space. So this figure here describes in a very general and really in a, in a simplified way, it's not exactly what we are doing, but in a simplified way, what is the domain of applicability? So we have a descriptive set of parameters. This is our parameters identifying the material. So in our case, the geometry, the composition, the number of atoms per unit cell. And here we have the answers. The blue dots are schematically the calculated or measured data points. And then we have a dashed fit and then we have a full fit. And let's see, let's look at the full fit, if, if full line. The full line fits the data very well in this region. So we have a model which says take a linear fit. If the fit is the, the, the straight line here, the answer is that the domain of applicability is essentially the gray region because the error is very small in this, between the full red line and the blue dots, very small in the gray region, and it increases significantly outside the gray region. So if you say, this is our model, then we also can say it only works in the gray region. Be careful if you would use it for something else. Now let's do this more systematically for the data which we had from the, had created for the NOMAD uh, competition on the transparent oxides. Identify the domain of sub, uh, by subgroup discovery. Now, you have seen the language is already, so we, we, we want to identify groups in the data where the model works. So we need, as you remember, for subgroup discovery, uh, a so-called qualifying function, which gives us really uh, the, uh, the analytic function which we have to optimize or conditions which you have to optimize. So the one thing is clear, the prediction error for the domain of applicability should be small compared to the prediction error of the whole set. So that's a requirement we have to, to optimize, make the prediction error small, as small as possible for certain data points. But of course, not for individual points. And that is the second point, which, which the second bullet, which we had also in the previous talk, the domain of applicability should be as large as possible. We don't want individual points. We want really regions. We want a consistent set of, of data points. And we like to describe all that in terms of interpretable conjunctions that we can later use for an analysis to understand why certain data groups may be problematic problematic or why the amount of data in certain groups may be not sufficient. Or to understand that maybe some, something is missing in our model, something is, the model is not really flexible enough. So we have a clear condition what we want to optimize, the data points which have a small error, but then which belong to a group and uh, having really uh, as, as, as big as possible, and describing this in terms of selectors and Boolean statements of somewhat the main parameters which we use. So consider selectors on the lattice vector lengths, on the angles, on the volume per atom, on the number of atoms per unit cell, on the composition, on the average oxygen cut ion distance. These were our descriptive parameters. And now we want to know, are there in these descriptive parameters ranges where the model works better? The number of atoms should be bigger than 
a certain number, or the bond lengths have to be smaller or should be in a, in a certain range. So this is what we want to find out and subgroup discovery should tell us. And we do this for the systems, as, as I said, and we do this for the same um, for the same method, uh, namely for a Gaussian kernel kernelish regression. Now I told you before that the different uh, competitors in the uh, in the Kegel competition use different methods, neural networks and, um, and, and decision trees and so on. But to have a good comparison, we felt we should in this case just use really Gaussian kernel regression, but using different representations. And uh, this is what you find here. Let me first really look here at this on the left side. So the machine learning models which we use are Ngram. So this is the winner of the Kegel competition. SOAP, smooth uh, overlap of atomic potentials, or the second one, uh, or the third one. And instead of this uh, bond order uh, um, definition and chemistry, we use what is called a, a many body tensor representation. This is the method developed by us. It has some similar philosophy as, as the bond order. Uh, as I said, the, the way these people have done it, it was very complicated and a very complicated mixture of, of chemical intuition and chemical input and this uh, um, uh, bond order. Here we just use a, a somewhat advanced bond order-like representation, which is called many body tensor representation. The all data error is loaded here. So it's 0.47 for the engram. Uh, it is uh, four point, uh, for 14, sorry, 14.7 uh, for the engram, 14.1, 14.2 for the other ones. So you see the errors for, the, for these three things are very, very similar. Now then we do the uh, subgroup discovery and uh, we find the domain of applicability. It's defined by, by the next uh, uh, part here, but let me first look at the, at the errors. In the domain of applicability, which is a reasonably small, but not too small area of the whole data space, the error is significantly reduced from 14 to 10, so something like 20, 30 percent, 14 to 11, and nearly 50 percent for the MBTD, MBTR, from 14 to 7 milliEV per cation. So we have an, a region in this whole data space where the error is small and where we can nicely live with this error. And here you see the conjunctions uh, which define the uh, domain of applicability. The three methods uh, have different domains of applicability. If you look more carefully, there is some overlap between them, but they are different models and therefore also have different areas where they work well. Uh, somewhat complicated in the engram, so B is one of the uh, axis of, of, of the um, uh, unit cell, gamma is one of the angles, and the uh, distance between oxygen and aluminum in average should be smaller than 2.06 angstrom, and the distance between gallium and oxygen should be smaller than 2.07 angstrom. Let me only go to the last one, to the MBTR. Here you see actually a quite different uh, thing. You see that this works best if the number of atoms in the unit cell is big, bigger than 50. Many of the systems had actually big unit cells, but uh, actually there were also many which have smaller unit cells. MBTR works most, most best if the number of atoms is big in the unit cell, which is interesting because that also gives us most information besides the periodicity. It gives us also more information about uh, pair correlations and uh, functions of, of, of distribution of atoms and so on. For smaller systems, you have less information. Therefore, this method doesn't really work very well. Otherwise, the angle and the distances are very similar to, to what the other systems or the, or the other methods already have found. The errors which I gave here, I think I hope I've said it, are of course the, not the training, but the test set error, because we always should we talk about errors and accuracy and, and, and the predict, talk about the prediction, not in what we have fitted. 
So we have a good way to do this. And uh, with this, I think I can summarize uh, that uh, the error distribution of machine learning models may vary ac across domains of the full population. This is called heteroscedasticity, this change over the data set. Finding conditions that identify a domain or maybe in fact even different, more, more than one domain, where the error is particularly low, this means identifying the domain of applicability for the special model and the special representation. This has many advantages and a, a big potential. Knowing the domain of, applic of applicability implies that we now know that outside this domain, prediction should be flagged as uncertain. Before, we have this general idea, machine learning fits all the data. Now we say, yes, it fits all the data, but in some of the data, the error actually is too big. And with this domain of applicability, we can uh, identify this clearly. In this way, we can also drive developments of improved representations. So we may find, if we have these conjunctions, because the conjunctions are interpretable, we can identify what is wrong or what is missing in our representation and to find something better. We can understand why data groups are more problematic than others. We can understand that some data domains may need more data. And uh, then we can say, we should in fact just add more data there. It's very expensive to do additional experiments. It's very expensive to do additional theory. At the moment, typically, the theory or the experiment in high throughput screening is in a more or less trial and error or in a random way. Now we could say uh, there is this domain of applicability. In this region, you don't need more data. You have a good description already. Add more data outside and therefore, in a systematic way, increase this domain of applicability. We call this artificial intelligence guided workflows. And this is one of the research projects we are really working on at the moment. If you want to read more about uh, these ideas, which I just presented in this talk, this is the paper where this is described very well. So with this, I think I am at the end of my lecture. And uh, again, at this uh, green board, we are at the Q and A session. So please ask me about the last talk. But in fact, you can ask me anything which comes to mind. We have a significant part of this lecture behind us. There are four more lectures coming. The next one is by Yilis Vreken on interpretability and causality, which we have mentioned several times. And you have gotten an idea about what interpretability may be. Uh, you, uh, we also will have a talk by Rampi Ramprasat from Atlanta and Georgia. And we have two talks which deal with experimental uh, data and trying to, to analyze them with artificial intelligence. So Q&A about this thing. But of course, if you have something else, you may also ask that and I will try to answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>